Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Linton, W2O's Global Data Privacy Officer. With me today is Nikki Bargov. She's a partner at the law firm Loeb & Loeb in Chicago. Nikki, please say hello and tell us a bit about your background. Dan, thanks so much for having me today. As you mentioned, I'm a partner at Loeb & Loeb in the Advanced Media and Technology Group, where I work on advertising, marketing, and privacy issues, but specifically focusing on the convergence of advertising and privacy. Great, and thank you so much for joining us. In this series, we discuss the most common privacy questions that we get from our clients. And today's question is, what should clients know about the California Privacy Rights Act or CPRA versus the existing California Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA? Nikki, what are some considerations here? Yeah, well, thanks for asking, Dan. I think the, uh, the part that's been discussed the most is this concept of do not share for advertising purposes, which is different than what is under CCPA right now, which is a do not sell right for consumers. And so, you know, when the CCPA came to be, the concept of do not sell was very confusing for the advertising industry, but we learned in some ways to adapt. So for example, if you were able to limit some of your advertising partners to being service providers, you could continue using personal information for advertising purposes because you weren't considered to be selling that information. Now under the CPRA, there's an added opt-out and that added opt-out is to opt out of the sharing of your personal information for cross contextual behavior advertising. And that really is targeting the interest-based advertising industry and expanding that opt out, even if you're not considered to be selling information to your advertising partners for interest-based advertising purposes, it still allows consumers to opt out. So that's one very important difference. I was just going to say, it sounds like they've uh, really um, clarified. I know that there was a lot of confusion about sell versus share and that Google and Facebook had kind of different opinions about that, but eventually everyone kind of coalesced and accepted that behavioral advertising was selling, but there was a, there's a whole period of, of confusion there, but it sounds like the CPI really just like cuts right to the heart and says, yeah, absolutely, that that is, that is definitely included. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the confusion came from this concept of associating sell with monetary consideration. And in a lot of advertising relationships, it's, it's, it isn't selling data in the traditional sense of, you know, putting a monetary value on each piece of data. But there is um, arguably a quid pro quo when it comes to sharing data for advertising purposes. And the CPRA recognized that there was that both that confusion and potentially a loophole to something that they wanted to target. And this was the effort to close that up. That makes sense. So um, the other thing that I noticed about the CPRA is that there's a new category of sensitive information uh, that wasn't there that covers things like government IDs or logging credentials or precise location and, and the usual suspects of religion, health data, and so on. What are the practical effects of this new addition to the CPRA? Yeah, so, you know, again, under CCPA, we had a do not sell and we had a delete um, right for consumers. And under the CPRA, we now have this option to limit the use of sensitive information. Now, do not sell was really aimed at how businesses share information with third parties, but it wasn't aimed at how businesses use information internally themselves. And the delete requirement, you know, it, it's subject to a number of exceptions, especially if there's a legitimate reason that the business needs to keep using that information, for example, to process an order or for legal reasons, you didn't necessarily have to delete that information. Under the CPRA, we now have this right for consumers to tell businesses that they would like those sensitive categories of information to be restricted in terms of processing. And so the implications of that is really, I, I think there's some pieces of personal information or sensitive personal information that businesses from a practical sense 
weren't using very widely, right? Social security numbers, probably not widely used. The processing for that was already very limited. But there are certain categories that are included in sensitive information, such as geolocation, that although we know we need consent for precise geolocation, uh, once it was collected, it was likely widely used by a lot of businesses. And now this gives consumers the right to say, you can collect that information, but you can only really use it for the purposes narrowly, you know, for which you really collected that information. And that, I think from a, how do you implement that? It's really thinking forward, how do we anticipate using this information? And, you know, it, it, it restricts, companies sort of making unplanned uses of those categories of information. Talk to me about the expanded right of action under CPRA. Uh, there's uh, uh, applying to data breaches, for example, that compromise an email address in combination with a password, which we didn't see in um, CCPA explicitly. What do, you, what do you expect to happen with this? Yeah, so the expanded definition in one way really just matches the definition of uh, triggering information under the general California data breach law. So it is it is syncing up those two um, those two laws a little closer than CCPA did. But because CCPA offers you know the private right of action and it has statutory damages associated with you know with data breaches, I would expect that this is this is likely to result in an onslaught of additional class actions because usernames and you know, password security questions are some of the more targeted pieces of information in a data breach. So it happens a little bit more often than for example, some even highly sensitive information. When it wasn't included in the CCPA and subject to statutory damages, you still had the option if there was an incident to pursue this under the California data breach law, but the California data breach law didn't give consumers the same uh, staggering remedies that the CPRA does. So I would anticipate that there's, you know, high likelihood that you're going to see more class actions and litigation coming out of that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, which leads naturally to the next question about uh, the CPRA's requirement for a new enforcement agency. What do you think we'll see uh, with that? Yeah, so again, this is an agency that is meant to be dedicated to, you know, focusing its attention on investigating data breaches and privacy violations for California residents. This kind of hyper focus for that agency is likely to put more scrutiny on businesses in terms of um, their privacy practices. And it, some, you know, sometimes as lawyers, we sort of look at the environment and we say, where are the regulators' efforts focused? And you know, how are their resources spread? With an agency, because they're hyper focused on privacy violations, you're likely going to see more investigations and more aggressive enforcement in this area by the agency. With that said, because the agency isn't you know, formed yet, we don't really have an idea of what their priorities are going to be. If you know, looking at the AG's actions uh, post enforcement date for CCPA, we're likely gonna see focus on, you know, again, do not sell, um, having an opt out for do not share and having the limitations on use of sensitive information because those are visible immediately when you visit a website, things like that. And so from my perspective, that's kind of low hanging fruit for enforcement. There's also uh, a new exclusion on publicly available data. We know that in CCPA, for example, that publicly available government data uh, was excluded from CCPA, but there's a new exclusion in CPRA for publicly available data that comes from a widely distributed media uh, that the consumer has disclosed publicly and not restricted to a particular audience. What do you, um, this is a, a matter dear and near to the hearts of W2O as we do a lot of social media analytics. Um, um, how do you see this having a, a larger effect on some of your clients? 
Yeah, I think this is really great for businesses generally, because at least from an advertising perspective, many businesses rely on social media analytics and collect information that's generally available from social media. It relieves these companies from the burdens of trying to navigate how to comply with CCPA, provide notice, provide opt-outs. Um, when you're dealing with information that is being broad, broadly broadcast to a wide you know, public audience. And I think it takes into account, um, this exclusion takes into account the practical, uh, the practical nature of social media listening and social media analytics. So this was a good development. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and lastly, um, we know that enforcement begins in 2023 with a one year look back. When should organizations uh, start to take action to adapt to the CPRA? Yeah, well, there, you know, there is definitely a wait and see approach at the moment because there are still regulations that are going to be forthcoming. And honestly, there are still other laws that are being developed around the same, um, you know, with the same concepts as what's in CPRA. With that said, however, I think, you know, for businesses, it's really, really important to look internally and sort of assess what kind of infrastructure may need to be built to support CPRA. So for example, you know, I always stress data mapping, refresh data mapping, look at the new categories of personal information and how they are mapped out. So for example, sensitive personal information versus personal information and start accounting for that in the data map because that process to really get it right can take such a long time. And that will also help later, you know, as you move along to assess the impact of CPRA on the business itself. So, you know, asking and talking to business stakeholders, what, what is going to happen when people opt out of, um, opt out of sharing? What is gonna happen when consumers ask to limit the use of sensitive information? and planning ahead. These are items that are already within the law. And while the regulations will provide clarity, these are also longer processes. Another, you know, another thing that I always recommend is going back to contracts and assessing whether, you know, contracts that are going to be, uh, that are going to continue to be implemented in 2023 may need to be revised for CPRA considerations. And then, you know, finally, for those companies that have, you know, that had prepared for CCPA already, some of this will be leveraging the backend technology to accommodate for new opt-out rights and, um, and for processes to restrict, uh, restrict the use of sensitive personal information, but still understanding what kind of backend technology needs to be built up is going to be really important. So that once we get to the regulations and we understand what the outward policies need to say, our infrastructure is in place to support the outward policies that we're putting into place. Absolutely, and we all know that IT infrastructure doesn't just pop into existence magically. So. <laughs> well, uh, that's the end of my questions. Thank you so much, Nikki, for joining us. I really appreciate it. And uh, for everyone watching, please join us again for our, the other episodes of Privacy Perspectives.